200 years ago, the clergy in Pekiliai served as a conduit of Germanic culture in Lithuania, and in the rough-hewn log house I found church books from the 17th and 18th centuries, as well as a lengthy manuscript by Dr. Johann Gaspar Ellenreiter describing the art of chemistry, which is the source of all knowledge, printed in Hamburg in 1723. I took advantage of the temporary calm in our section of the front and spent my nights reading by candlelight. These candles were locally produced, made of pure beeswax, and gave off a pleasant fragrance. Later we moved these candles, along with the beautifully crafted candelabras, to the basement, hoping that at least these works of art would survive the artillery fire that we knew was inevitable. One evening one of the soldiers was sitting at an antique organ. It took the help of two men to pump up its massive leather furs, and a chorus and a Maria romance were playing and the sounds of the music reached even the soldiers on the front lines. Not a single shot was fired on either side during this whole concert. For several days this little chapel was flanked by Russian artillery shells, as if out of respect for this holy beauty. Eventually, it also fell a victim to the brutal shelling, and the flames soon consumed it entirely. On the same day some civilian appeared at our position, and with visible anguish introduced himself as the priest of this chapel. When we returned to him, the ritual bowls, candelabrum, bedspreads, and other articles of spiritual value, he expressed his joy and relief at having recovered the things so dear to him and his flock. He came many times afterward under artillery shells to retrieve what he could carry to safety. The inhabitants of the town sought refuge in the surrounding forests, awaiting the Soviet advance and the imminent capture of the town by the Russians. The priest allowed us to escort them to a place of relative safety, but only after giving us his blessing beforehand. Given the very uncertain and ominous situation, we were grateful for these words of comfort, except for enemy attacks of up to one company in the first battle of Kurland and systematic artillery raids, our section of the front remained ominously quiet. Only in mid-October did Russian tanks appear near Polenjin, north of Memel on the Baltic, which was west of us, and we were at once sharply reminded that our lifeline to the homeland had been cut. Rumors and news from the most dubious and unconfirmed sources were rampant among the soldiers. We will go for a breakthrough to the south and make our way to our own. Like a moving cauldron, we will strike at the Russian flank to put pressure on them, to throw them out of East Prussia, we will push the Red Army back behind the borders of the Reich to keep Central Europe free from the domination and slavery of the Red Soviet star. Indeed, by the end of October a desperate breakthrough plan was indeed being hatched in some units south of Lvov. But even before it came to fruition, the Soviets struck with such ferocity that the surviving formations could consider themselves lucky to have survived such attacks and continued to occupy their defensive positions. By order of the commander of Army Group North, it was forbidden to use the expression cauldron of Corland. There were even rumors, although according to my information not confirmed, that any of the soldiers could be given a death sentence if it was heard about our hopeless situation in this cauldron. Since the destruction of the 6th Army at Stalingrad, the word has carried an ominous hidden meaning of imminent and inevitable disaster. With the issuance of this order, however, even the most optimistic among us, those who continued to cling to the belief in the final victory, now realized the hopelessness of our situation. Nevertheless, it must be said that the will to resist the Soviets and the fighting spirit in the ranks of the soldiers of Courland remained unbroken. The official name for the trapped army was the expression Kurland Bridgehead. From a strategic point of view, this bridgehead was seen as a launching pad for the beginning of the offensive. The term was applied with the dubious purpose of giving the impression that our positions would later be used as a springboard for a new offensive that would liberate East Prussia, hence the demand that we continue to cling tenaciously to our shrinking positions. In October, some units prepared to leave Courland by ship for transfer to the front in East Prussia. But these plans were cancelled when it became clear that the badly battered divisions with the few remaining tanks would not have enough strength for a marginally worthwhile offensive. Therefore, the troops in Courland were destined to stay on their lines and obey the principle of fight to the last bullet. 
The strength and determination of the soldiers in the trenches in no way depended on a colonel general with a gold party badge. Such distinctive traits as the will to resist, willingness to sacrifice, became innate in the soldiers during the three and a half years of war, which the division spent on the battlefields of southern and northern Russia. We needed no guidance from political officers to display these qualities. We saw the true meaning of our operation in Courland clearly in one thing the defense of European culture. We believed that our presence on the northern flank of the Soviet army could prevent the red tanks from breaking through to the very heart of Europe. Perhaps the hour of Europe's birth was not far off, and it depended solely on our will to resist the Soviet army until the last moment. We knew too little that Western politicians had turned a blind eye to the tragedy unfolding in Eastern and Central Europe. Communism collapsed across the culture as Western armies demobilized and virtually ceased fighting. The guns had long since fallen silent, and the survivors in Courland were rotting in Russian prisoner of war camps surrounded by four towers on tall poles with high barbed wire encircling this death zone. Colonel General Guderian, chief of the general staff, tried desperately to persuade Hitler to evacuate troops from Courland and used them to defend Berlin. Soviet propaganda had made it clear over the years, through tons of leaflets dropped on our trenches that the ultimate goal of the Red Army was the capture of Berlin. This was made even clearer by the printed footage of attacking Soviet soldiers storming the Brandenburg Gate, complete with tanks and swaying banners. Instead of following strategic sense and facing reality, Hitler insisted on carrying out his order to hold all positions in Courland. Colonel General Schirner vowed the impossible, to hold the front on the lines of October 1944. Although the Navy had prepared a detailed plan by which evacuation was possible, Hitler held firmly to his belief that the positions in Courland would be needed for a future offensive. In Schirner, he found a general who bowed to his every demand, willing to promise a miracle. The opinion of professionals like Kuderian and other senior officers were not taken into account, with frequent outbursts of hysterical anger, and Hitler again began to build idealistic plans for new offensives, using divisions and people, long ago defeated in the vastness of Russia. Promises were made that the new revolutionary weapons would change the course of the war and strategic decisions, although at this time German industry was crumbling under the blows of uncounted bombers. In December 1944, the Ardennes offensive stalled, and the imminent disaster became apparent to all realists. Thus, the 132nd Infantry Division of Army Group North, now called Army Group Kurland, stood to the very end on this last front. For almost seven months, the regiments fought on the Baltic against an enemy incredibly superior in manpower and equipment. We were determined not to surrender under any circumstances, and the troops in Kurland were to bear a formidable distinction. They remained the only combat units in the German army that had never been defeated in open combat. In November 1944, the last front in Courland stretched from the Baltic Shoals, 30 kilometers south of Lubava, in a general direction to the east, past Mojaikin, and wrapped north from Tukum to the Baltic near the Gulf of Riga. The division's position was very similar to that in which the units of the 18th Army were during the battle for Leningrad, in the sense that the Red Army was striving to reach the road in Lubava, through which the supply was coming, and thus cut our sack in half. The whole front had a total length of about 200 kilometers, and our division from the end of 1944 occupied a central position in it, located southeast of Frauenberg. The Venta River, or Vindava, as it was called in German, in general, repeated the configuration of the division's defensive lines. On November 1, 1944, the division held positions on the window, and within a few days our sector had been reinforced with some companies. Despite the arrival of new reserve units, on November 19 the situation became so critical that we had to defend a sector of the front 11 kilometers long. That was about two soldiers per 100 meters of front that we had to defend. One afternoon one day in early November I received a dispatch from the I Battalion, 437th Regiment, about the expected arrival of Colonel General Scherner. This terrible, terrifying general was inspecting our positions, and, understandably, 
I was supposed to brief him briefly on his arrival about the current situation in the area. Scherner was notorious for his passion for checking the state of communications. It was also widely known that if he found anything he didn't like, a hail of reprimands, demotions, and similar punishments would immediately follow. Sometimes he demoted or promoted purely on impulse, as it suited him. There were rumors that his chauffeur kept three different military uniforms in his trailer and that several times he started the day as a field officer, then for the slightest infraction was transferred to the ranks, but after lunch was again promoted to field officer. Every trip to the front was accompanied by threats, and those who served in rear units could expect punishment in the form of immediate transfer to the front line. General Devil of the Mountain Units, a professional officer to the Corps, once said of Scherner that he would have been better off as a Feldgender than as a general. This opinion was widely shared among the troops, who were still susceptible as far as their leaders were concerned. Curiously enough, this same general, who had shown no understanding of his troops at the front and callously condemned them to death by his orders to hold unholdable positions at all costs, was captured by the Americans at the end of the war in an alpine hut to which he had fled in an attempt to evade answering for his deeds after the surrender of Germany. When he was captured, he was wearing a traditional Bavarian alpine suit, which he had traded for his uniform and a gold party badge. Only weeks before, he had subjected an unthinkable number of his soldiers to mass executions for similar acts of cowardice. The Colonel General actually showed up to inspect our positions. His automobile, with a checkerboard-like flag mounted on it, arrived late in the afternoon, and I greeted him, as was my custom, by saluting him curtly as he approached. He answered me with a sullen, impersonal salute, after which he did not extend his hand. I immediately got the feeling that he had come here on purpose to cause us trouble. I had carefully prepared my company for this visit. At the entrance to the dugout stood two sentries, properly dressed in full field uniform, with helmets and rifles. Field Fibble liaison officer Steinitzer personally sat at the field table to see that everything was going as planned. The radio operators were inspecting and tuning their equipment now and then in advance. All communications team contacts with the artillerymen and forward observers were in perfect condition. The general asked for a summary of the situation in our section, which I had prepared in advance. I took the liberty of depicting the situation exactly as it appeared to me, and I outlined the picture to him sincerely and honestly. Every day a Russian balloon with observers on the horizon rose into the sky. In spite of our repeated requests, not a single German plane appeared to put an end to the activity of the enemy observers. Therefore, the Soviet artillery fired uninterruptedly at selected targets as it pleased. In addition, we believe that a number of positions along the Vindava in our sector had been taken under fire in preparation for a tank attack, which we expected to occur within a few days. The number of our troops is too small to hold the sector entrusted to us. Our defenses are too sparse on this stretch of front. The lack of heavy weapons, above all anti-tank weapons, is threatening. The batches of anti-tank mines received are not usable because they lack uses. The esteemed Colonel General clearly did not enjoy such a negative report from a junior officer. He left abruptly, leaving us with a definite feeling that he was not at all satisfied with what had happened. It was then rumored that while visiting the positions in the rear he had drunk several bottles of wine with Shansky of the artillery battalion and began to complain openly to him about the conduct of the infantry units in the front line. He certainly did not strengthen my confidence and my faith in his leadership, but only confirmed the stories we had previously heard about his peculiar style of command. Not a single word of encouragement was spoken to me personally, nor even to those soldiers who for his sake stood with their weapons at their shoulder in the trenches. I was used to a different type of German general. Moreover, he laughed at my assessment of the situation, criticized my prediction of an impending tank attack, saying that if the attack and will take place, then far to the west, in the direction of Lubava. The great strategist was wrong. On November 20, a Russian artillery raid hit our positions and the regiment to our left, and large groups of Soviet tanks rushed through Vindava. During the so-called Second Battle of Kurland, the Russians broke through our front in several places, 
including the sector held by our division. Only thanks to reinforcements from various units was this offensive halted a few days later near Frauenberg. Like our tank attacks at the beginning of the war, the standard tactic of the Russians was to attack along the front in various places, and when the front was broken through, all additional reserves were concentrated in this sector to gain a bridgehead through which all available forces were rushed into the gap. At times false attacks were made, and in another sector a powerful blow was struck to break through the defenses when the reserves of the defenders were running low. To seize control of the situation, it was often necessary to move entire divisions within a few hours to weak points on the front where a breakthrough was occurring or was considered imminent. This was further complicated by the fact that during the rainy season the roads became terrible, turning into quagmire under columns of heavy vehicles and countless soldiers and horses. During the second battle for Courland our units managed to hold off the Russian onslaught, but immediately afterwards the rains came, and any movement, no matter how important, was carried out with great effort. The terrain along the front line became a vast swamp, before which even the Russians with their numerous motorized formations retreated. German intelligence units reported that Soviet tank formations had withdrawn southward and were concentrating near Vainod, Pekilia. This meant the end of the second battle for Courland. The troops were exhausted and exhausted. The front consisted mostly of shallow muddy pits, half filled with water from melting snow and ice, in which soldiers took turns on duty, trying to maintain their physical ability to continue resisting the enemy. Supplies, when at all possible, became sporadic due to impassable roads and constant interruptions due to enemy shelling and endless aerial gunfire when enemy planes suddenly appeared out of nowhere in the gray sky. Horses often fell over for lack of forage, and for soldiers sitting in the trenches, hot food was a rare luxury. Early in December I was shocked by the news that two weeks' house arrest had been imposed on me. Apparently, Colonel General Scherner did not like my negative, albeit honest and accurate, assessment of our situation, and had requested this punishment for me as a result of his inspection of forward positions. It was also possible that he did not like my Swabian dialect, from which he realized that I was from Wittenberg, which reminded him, in turn, of the Fox of the Desert, Field Marshal General Rommel, whose fame and reputation he may have envied and resented. The division commander, General Wagner, arrived at our battalion headquarters to inform me personally of the punishment imposed on me. This exceptionally professional and responsible officer informed me that this report would under no circumstances adversely affect my service in the army and that he was, after great resistance, carrying out as ordered. He further stated that my service, backed by years of combat experience, was badly needed behind the lines. Then I reported to Major Deschamps, Chief of Operations at Regimental Headquarters, who informed me that construction battalions and various units of other formations were assembling deep in the central part of our cauldron. During the lull at the front, it is necessary to begin construction of defensive structures in the rear areas. Past experience has proved that in the event of a breakthrough, such units in the rear, such as artillery, became a valuable means of creating a barrier to the enemy invasion. And so I was instructed to develop a plan and build the second and third lines of defense. They were to include deep, interconnected tank traps, trenches, gun positions, and a combined system of earthworks stretching between the positions for a thousand meters. Far in our rear there was a network of fortifications, which were to be prepared in case of the final evacuation of the Curland divisions by sea, if the order of the Supreme Command came to that. A relatively simple decision had ripened in the minds of the soldiers. Better to dig trenches than graves. My task was made easier by the presence of a trencher towed by a tractor, capable of digging trenches up to 80 centimeters deep and 500 meters long in one night. During the daytime, we were busy thinking and working out plans for additional defensive positions, and at night, when we could work without being threatened by the ubiquitous stormtroopers, we built many dugouts and trenches in anticipation of the last, powerful Soviet strike through our defenses to the Baltic. In mid-September our work was suddenly suspended because of severe frost. The ground froze to stone. 
The viscous roads became passable again, and an atmosphere of expectation thickened over the army. Companies in the front line and artillery observers reported noises coming from the enemy trenches to accompany large movements of equipment. At night the clanking of tank tracks was clearly audible. Our artillery remained incapable of firing at closed targets, as ammunition was becoming scarce, and was strictly rationed. From time to time swarms of fighters and squadrons of bombers with five-pointed red stars on the fuselage and wings flew over us. With complete impunity they made daily flights on those clear, frosty days of December, going to bomb the harbors at Labava and Vendava, through which the supply lines ran, seeking to cut our thin rear arteries. The anti-aircraft units and the few fighters remaining with the army group fought valiantly against countless enemy planes. Our fighters were commanded by Luftwaffe General Flugbeil, and in December 15 and 16 alone our pilots shot down 25 Soviet planes over Kurland. To facilitate my task of building and planning defenses, Dr. Schlipp, the regimental physician of the 438th Regiment, invited me to share with him his dwelling on a Latvian farm. Two women and an elderly man continued to occupy part of the building, and the youngest of the women, his daughter, spoke German quite well. When asked why they had not tried to move farther to the rear to seek escape from the daily artillery raids, they replied, Where to? There is no home further away, only the sea. They heated the washing room for us and fried potatoes, while next door in the shed an old man was chopping wood. He had spent his whole life here, on this land. One day he said, Now we Latvians have dogs on our land, but soon we'll have to make friends with wolves. The meaning of those words was self-explanatory. We called him Dr. Poldy, and his work never ended. Often legions of wounded men were brought to him by wagon under cover of darkness, lying on a pile of straw. These soldiers were bandaged with dirty, blood-stained bandages, weakened, unshaven, and dirty, with no hope or barely a spark of optimism. Poldy took them into his care, and under the precarious protection of the Red Cross flag, he tended to the wounded, changing bandages, administering painkillers, stitching torn flesh and splinting broken bones. The severely wounded were loaded onto sleds and taken for surgery to the division's assembly point, a few kilometers behind the front line. Such helpers to the exhausted and tired, doctors and medical personnel who carried the rod of mercury on their shoulders and a scalpel in the pockets of their uniforms, proved their necessity many times in the future and during the period of imprisonment in Russia. In the barracks at Poldi's we had many meaningful conversations. I would come in the deep night from my construction of defensive lines, sit down near the fireplace to be close to the fire. In the flickering light, he and his medical assistant would sit down with me and proclaim a toast in honor of my safe return. It was warm and cozy, a piece of home that radiated not only from the fireplace, but from the heart. Poldi was a dark-haired, very serious doctor with dark brown eyes. I often imagined him to be some descendant of the Roman or Gallic legionaries who occupied the places of Castel Mains that he called home. We often remembered our homes and asked ourselves whether we would have to stand before the ancient monuments in our homeland again, whether we would again enter the half-dark Mains Cathedral to pray and always the specter of our fate loomed over us, and loomed over us during every conversation. How would it all end? Would the army of Corland be sacrificed to the irresistible onslaught of communism, supported by the immense industrial power of the combined Allied forces? Would it then be said over our graves, as it was said after the Stalingrad defeat, that the army of Corland fulfilled to the last bullet its duty to its country and people, fighting against a superior enemy to enable the creation of new defensive lines, contributing to the defense of its fatherland. I was reminded of the plight of troops virtually isolated and abandoned far to the south, on the Crimean Peninsula, our former battlefield. It was reported that as boats and ferries rushed into the open sea, heading for Odessa, the remaining defenders, who had been abandoned to their fate, shouted after the departing ships, we are honorable citizens of the nation. And then they embarked on a long, sorrowful journey to captivity. A few days before the expected offensive began, 
a new bunker hospital was prepared near the regimental headquarters, which made it possible to transport the wounded to safety. The Latvian farmhouse at Stadini, where Poldi and I enjoyed temporary comfort, was later riddled with tank shelling. We never sought its inhabitants again and never learned of their fate. A hard-traveled road led through our division section from Pampali to Stadini and then bifurcated. One road led northeast to Frauenberg and the other to Lubava. And it was at this fork that the Russians tried to break through to split the Kurland army and take Lubava. The Third Battle for C.O.U.R.O. and On December 21, 1944, at exactly six o'clock a firestorm hit our section of the front. The horizon came alive, glowing with flashes of shots from an infinite number of heavy guns. It was confirmed that in the sector of the 438th Grenadier Regiment alone, more than 800 barrels, consisting of a deadly combination of heavy guns, rocket launchers and mortars, fired multiple volleys at our positions. A torrential firestorm of incredible power rained down on the trenches. Machine gun nests, trenches, dugouts and fortified firing positions on the front line collapsed in clouds of dust and smoke. The ground shook, rumbled, crumbled, and collapsed. Dugouts collapsed. Trenches were compared to the ground. For three long hours an invisible force pounced frantically on the ground, seeking our last refuge in the darkness of battle. At first the heavy fire was aimed at our forward positions, then it shifted to the heights of Stadini, and then moved forward to a wooded area in our rear and fell upon the regimental headquarters. Treetops were blown to splinters, whole trees flew into the air, shells pounded the reinforced concrete dugouts and completely covered everything around us with their bursts. Minutes seemed like an eternity. The first wounded appeared, stumbling, wandering aimlessly, often without helmets, in blood-stained uniforms. Those who could not move on their own were carried out wrapped in cloak tents by soldiers straining under their weight. The wounded groaned in agony and pounded wildly on the ground as they waited for the doctor. Poldi and his assistants labored feverishly. I tried to help them by applying a tight bandage to the chest wound. Some of the wounded, who were able to speak coherently, told me that Ivan had broken through in the neighboring sector of the front on the left and concentrations of tanks had been seen. Suddenly, the shelling of our position stopped. In the distance, to our left and right, shells and rockets continued to fall with indescribable fury. I glanced across the makeshift operating table at Poldi and felt the nerves in my neck quiver with anticipation. He cast a glance at me, looked away, nodded understandingly, and then silently began stitching up his patient's wounds again. The silence on our section of the front was an ominous sign that I had encountered in previous battles. The Soviet artillery had stopped shelling us and shifted its fire to our flanks. We were occupying a corridor through which enemy armored vehicles would attempt to penetrate our rear. I dropped the roll of bandages and rushed to the door of the medical dugout, grabbing my carbine on the way. At the entrance I heard the sounds of rumbling engines and the scraping of tracks, accompanied by deafening bursts. Red attack planes were flying over the forest, dropping bombs and shelling us with machine guns and wing-mounted cannons. The roar of the engines grew louder and louder, and through the rolling rumble of explosions I unmistakably recognized the rumble of Soviet T-34s. From the ruins of the headquarters I noticed several soldiers running past us in panic with carbines in their hands. Bearing directly toward the dugout, they collapsed to the ground panting from running, shrieking, tanks, tanks. I ran outside and immediately stumbled over the split branches of large trees torn from the bare, vertically protruding stumps. Shells were bursting everywhere, and near the communications dugout I ran into my old friend Lieutenant Resch, the son of a pastor from Saarbrücken. A tank shell explosion had ripped open his abdomen, and as he sank to his knees, I picked him up and slowly laid him on the ground. As I looked into his dying eyes, I felt overwhelmed with rage, the kind of rage that I had seldom experienced in previous battles and at the sight of other deaths, an all-consuming rage that only rarely distinguishes between enemy and friend, an exorbitant sense of anger that knows no limits, 
that transcends the limits of the simple emotions of courage or fear. Courage and fear are the emotions of a normal human being and have no place in the suicidal nightmare into which we have been plunged. You are overwhelmed by the simple, primitive passion of revenge. Vengeance. Revenge. The hammer pounded in my brain. To destroy the attackers. To kill them. The ones who destroyed the people closest to you. With so many people dead, why should I survive? Better to die now, killing the enemy, than to wait for the inevitable. I struggled to my feet and blindly rushed forward. I was vaguely aware that there were two more fighters running beside me. When we reached the headquarters of the 14th Company, I noticed several men from the anti-tank unit furiously preparing their FOST patrons for close combat. Several FOST patrons stood leaning against the wall, near the door to the dugout. Come on. I shouted at the top of my voice. Come on. Let's go. They're coming. I grabbed one of the long gray-green tubes loaded with blunt, bulbous shells, and through the trees I covered the distance of about fifty paces to the edge of the forest, oriented by the sound of heavy armored vehicles. The air around me was filled with the piercing whistle of bullets, and the shells continued to explode in the treetops, sending white-hot shrapnel to the ground, which whistled toward the ground and bumped heavily into it. Suddenly, about twenty meters away from me, I noticed through the undergrowth a long barrel of a T-34, slowly but relentlessly moving forward, knowing very well that usually a tank is accompanied by at least a platoon of infantry. I stepped back, made a long arc through the forest, and began to get closer to this massive silhouette, taking cover behind the trees. When I came to the edge of the forest near the huge tank, I knelt down between the piles of blown branches. My heart was ready to jump out of my chest, and from here, from thirty paces, I could clearly see this steel colossus, on which several large numbers were painted next to the red star. I quickly took the safety off the Faust patron and stuck to the site. I held my breath, trying unsuccessfully to calm my racing heart. The blood seemed to throb with tension in my throat. I placed the site right in the middle of the huge red star, with a white border painted on the tower, and with a last effort of will I forced myself to stay calm and keep the sight straight on the target. Slowly but firmly he pressed the trigger. With a noisy explosion, a tongue of fire erupted behind me in the direction of the forest. The projectile, clearly visible to the naked eye, roared forward and struck the turret. The charge fired unerringly, scattering flames and red-hot shrapnel inside the heavily armed machine. Immediately the big round hatch opened, and a thin stream of smoke rose from the tank into the sky, followed by an incredible silence. Tightly pressed to the ground, I watched the second tank, previously unseen, in some fifty steps backward breaking its way through the thicket, moving away from its destroyed companion. He broke through a strip of trees and made his way out into the open, where a Russian infantry company lay in plain sight huddled on the ground. My two companions from the anti-tank company destroyed this tank just as I had finished off the lead vehicle. From our hiding place behind the trees, the three of us opened fire with carbines on the Russian company lying 200 meters away on the frozen ground. We exchanged short bursts and the Russians began to withdraw, dragging their wounded behind them. We collapsed to the ground, physically and mentally devastated by the experience. We had successfully repulsed the reinforced enemy company and survived. Captain Brantner's self-propelled guns arrived. One of them received a direct hit on the way. The other was able to move and open fire on the column of Russian tanks advancing on the heights of Stadini. On the first day of the battle at Stadini, the Russians, because of the 438th Regiment, lost over 20 tanks during a skirmish at some junction of roads that led to Frauenberg and Lavava. My Fospatron destroyed the leading tank at the head of the attacking group, and a second tank was hit by two soldiers from the 14th Anti-Tank Company. Three more tanks were destroyed in close combat by other Grenadiers, and the self-propelled tank accounted for the rest of those now burning and exploding on the battlefield. Thus on the first day the spearhead of the attacking group was broken and a major disaster averted. On December 10, Captain Zoll, Knight's Cross Chevalier, 
commander of the 14th Company, 436th Regiment, was assigned to go to Pampoli as commander of a battle group of about 100 men. It consisted of two infantry platoons, one platoon of heavy machine guns, one five-man ATT calculation, a small number of sappers, and one or two forward artillery observers. The day of December 12 was calm. The sky remained overcast, with clouds floating low as Zal's battle group set about constructing defensive lines. They were expecting a Russian attack. Day after day, they feverishly reinforced their positions. On December 16, heavy artillery fire rained down on the earthworks, forcing the soldiers to seek shelter in narrow trenches and makeshift dugouts. Artillery fire continued intermittently for several days. Shelling began unexpectedly, stopping only for a few hours to begin again. On December 21, the Russians went on the attack, having previously subjected our positions to a heavy artillery bombardment, which made any movement impossible. By noon, infantry and tank units had broken through our defenses near Pampoli, and in the afternoon the besieged grenadiers were cut off and surrounded. The number of killed and wounded continued to rise, the dead lying in the trenches where death had caught them, the wounded receiving only superficial care under the incessant fire of a superior enemy. Ammunition, medical supplies, and food were quickly used up. Radio communication with regiment or division was no longer possible. The last orders received repeatedly insisted that we must hold our positions at all costs. Our sack continued to shrink in size. Facing total annihilation within hours, a breakout and retreat to the division position was contemplated. The ammunition for the heavy weapons was exhausted, and for want of tractors the guns had to be destroyed and abandoned. The transportation of the wounded was quickly organized. Despite all efforts, repeated attempts to contact the division failed, so there was no official confirmation of the retreat. The decision to break through at dawn was made without a command from above. Columns were formed to transport the wounded on sledges or on cloak tents used in makeshift stretchers. The exhausted fighters who survived were preparing to break through to their troops. At 3.30 a.m. on December 22, the order to withdraw was given. An hour later the columns moved toward the German trenches west of Pampali through an unoccupied hollow and took a northerly direction. The battered column was unevenly dispersed, with the head sentinel in front, the wounded in the middle, and the rearguard behind them. The advance was slow but successful, and without noticing any movement on the part of the enemy, the column reached the German trenches. Coming into contact with the main forces of the Army Kurland, the head sentinel came under fire, being unable to give the correct password, but they were soon recognized, and at 7.00, the main column passed through the German front line. The survivors of the battle group found themselves in a sector occupied by I Battalion, 436th Infantry Regiment, and they were quickly escorted to regimental headquarters where they were warmly welcomed. There they celebrated their successful rescue and were allowed to eat and get some rest before being sent to the front line. The fighting raged until the end of December. This sixth and last wartime Christmas remained silent and depressing for the troops. Our thoughts were constantly on the miserable, if not hopeless, situation in which we found ourselves. We took solace only in being amongst our own, close to comrades with whom we had shared so much of what we had endured over weeks, months, and years. On Christmas Eve, December 24, an infantry battalion from another division passed us on its way to the front line to reinforce this section and only the measured stopping of worn, soiled soldiers on the frozen ground could be heard. As the column slowly stretched past the trenches, the soft sounds of silent night, holy night, could be discerned above the line of exhausted soldiers. There was no peace left on earth. In the last battles the division suffered heavy losses, many soldiers fell victim to artillery and machine guns, and we were forced to leave part of the territory to the Soviets to avoid total destruction. At the end of December, the division was replaced and redeployed to a quieter sector south of Lvava. The Third Battle of Kurland was another test of the troops' ability to withstand in the face of a far superior enemy, and again we passed the test, although the victory was pyrrhic.
In the official reports of the OK Audio, our last battle of 1944 is described as follows. Army Group Kurland destroyed 513 tanks, 79 field guns, and 145 airplanes. In the center of the bloodiest battles was not only our division, but also the 225th North German Infantry Division, which held the area to our left. A total of 20 reinforced enemy divisions were thrown against the positions of the 24th, 205th, 215th, 290th, 329th Infantry Divisions and the 31st People's Grenadier Division. The 912th Army Assault Gun Brigade, a regiment from the 12th Armored Division, and a battalion of armored infantry on armored personnel carriers from the 5th Regiment, led by Captain Goss, known on many parts of the front simply as the man in the visor helmet. All of these units were constantly sent into counterattacks. Without reinforcements from self-propelled guns and the few remaining tanks in the Kurland army, the defensive battles could never end in success in terms of repelling enemy attacks. In the second and third battles for Kurland, our already weakened division lost in excess of a thousand irreplaceable soldiers killed, wounded, and missing. January 1945. Our homeland is crumbling in fire and smoke. Waves of Allied bombers darken the sky over cities and industrial centers. Houses and streets burn at night in streaming streams of glowing asphalt. Innocent women and children die by the thousands, their bodies turned into burning coals in this phosphorescent maelstrom. The borders of the homeland we have known so far are shrinking due to the relentless attacks of powerful enemies. The annihilation and defeat we have so long refused to recognize is becoming a reality. On January 2 of the new year, I stood next to four other soldiers of the division, who were also noted for destroying enemy tanks in close combat. At 18th Army Headquarters, one of the commanders, Lieutenant General Aaron Friedbog, summoned us to his headquarters in recognition of our services. The General's headquarters was located in an old picturesque estate with an old mansion built in the style of an 18th century fortress, surrounded by a beautiful park. The branches of the huge trees that fringed the imposing building were covered with a thick layer of snow. In preparation for our meeting with the general, the staff barber cut and shaved us in the small dwelling next door. The adjutant waited patiently until the barber had accomplished his task, and then we were quickly ushered into the hall of the fortress. A massive panel door opened, and we tensed in anticipation as the arrival of our commander was announced. We were introduced to a gray-haired gentleman, in whose eyes one could easily discern the heavy weight of responsibility, especially in these unfortunate days, that he bore for so many in our beleaguered Corland army. He warmly shook hands with each of us, and paused before asking the obligatory questions, awarding each member of our group a silver and black badge for destroying tanks. Then he treated us to a small amount of brandy and tobacco thanking us again for our service to the fatherland, before informing us of an additional award of leave, and we were released to our units. Since the summer months the widespread ban on vacations had come into effect. Travel to Germany was no longer permitted, perhaps because of the massive destruction of our towns and industrial centers by Allied bombers, which was evident in all densely populated areas. This prohibition was in force in the Kurland army, but the exception was made for fighters who had special merits, including the destruction of an enemy tank by means of close combat. The latter were by definition limited to special anti-tank shaped charges, mines, and phosphatrons. In these special cases, home leave could be authorized. The next day, January 3, accompanied by four men, a field fleet, two effriers, and a junior effriator, I boarded a fishing vessel that had been mobilized for naval service in the port of Lubava, and we were soon sailing westward on the Baltic to our homeland. My alpine knapsack contained few personal belongings and a piece of smoked horse meat as my travel rations for the journey. I also carefully stowed an oil painting of my protector Madonna, which had remained with me since the retreat from Pekilia. We were on our way to the ancient port city of Danzig, where we arrived after an eight-hour crossing of the Baltic, without incident. There we disembarked at night, 
and after settling in at the Stettner Hof Hotel, the next morning began our journey home to South Germany and the Rhine. Along the way we saw with our own eyes the destroyed towns and factories. We felt the hopelessness of the people, the innocents who suffered for the folly of others, the pain of the women and children whom we were supposed to protect in the trenches of Courland. The realization that our relatives and others were living in the daily horror of bombing left no room in us for the joy of returning home. We had slipped from one hell to find ourselves in another, a different form of purgatory, where our personal risk of encountering the enemy was negligible, yet we were powerless to stop those waves of bombers flying over us with impunity. Here one could not take a Foss patron or a rifle in one's hand and repel the enemy. One could only wait hopelessly. There was little joy in being away from familiar surroundings. Visiting my father, I got a glimpse of the extent of the diabolical acts our leaders were doing to the world. My father, who served as a police official, shared with me his questions and speculations about the fate of our fellow citizens deemed undesirable by our leaders in Brown. He spoke of the many death certificates for people who had been deprived of their freedom by the government, received in the past months from various government offices, sometimes accompanied by the deceased person's meager personal belongings. It is simply impossible, he told me confidentially, that so many people could die of heart failure. Something terrible is going on. This observation, along with the more elusive signs casually noticed in our daily lives, helped solve crimes committed by the government that it could not deny. I was shocked at the sight of the devastation that had befallen the city of Stuttgart. Having been accustomed on the eastern front to the sight of burned villages and destroyed factories, it was still painful to see entire residential areas turned into blackened piles of ruins. Having taken a particularly heavy blow in a series of bombings in September 1944, much of Stuttgart lay in ruins. The residence of the former Württemberg royalty, the new palace, was completely destroyed, and through the gaping, shattered windows one could see the once elegant curtains now billowing in the wind whistling in the midst of the grim ruins. Throughout the city, work parties made up of prisoners of war, Hitler youth groups, and mobilized foreign workers were busy clearing streets and buildings. Posters were hung on buildings and intersections warning that looters would be shot. Photographing any destruction was strictly forbidden and severely punished. The city, familiar to me from the days of my youth, had disappeared in a horrible pile of ashes and rubble. I traveled to Dornstetten to see my grandparents and was pleased to see that the outlying towns and villages were still intact, relatively unaffected by the catastrophe that had struck the big cities. Satisfied to see relatives, I boarded a commuter train bound for Mulekir. On the way, we were attacked by a lone American fighter bomber, which shot up the entire slow-moving defenseless train. With its fire, the plane disabled the locomotive, which came to a grinding, slow stop, blowing huge puffs of steam and smoke into the sky. Panic-stricken passengers flood from the cars to seek shelter on the ground, while at the same time the plane lay on the wing and with a roaring engine went on a second run, continuing its bombardment. I tried to help some passengers to get off the train, but I threw myself on the ground when the plane flew overhead, rattling machine guns, and on a strafing flight the airplane again struck the locomotive with impunity. In a few seconds, the raid was over. I survived my first and only encounter with the American enemy and on my native soil. Miraculously only a few of the passengers were slightly wounded, and in a few hours we were able to continue our journey again. In the first days of February I reported to headquarters, which had been transferred from Stuttgart to the Ludwigsburg. It was necessary to mark my return from leave, and thus secure my return to my unit in Courland. At the first table in the duty room, I was met by a staff filled feeble who spoke well of my awards. When he learned that I was returning from leave and would be going back to my division in Kurland, he remarked that my frontline experience, especially in close combat against enemy armored vehicles, would find more suitable application here. He added that instructors with such experience were being assembled for use in training members of the Hitler Youth in the handling and tactics of fighting with Foss patrons, since the invasion of Germany by the Western Allies was imminent. The proposal to train 15 
and 16-year-olds to fight enemy tanks made my blood run cold. I was of the firm conviction that, despite our military situation, sending children to their death in close combat with a Faust patron on their shoulder was senseless and tantamount to murder. Furthermore, such measures would have little or no effect on the advance of the tanks of a determined and hardened enemy. The Stabsfeld Febel must have sensed my indignation at this suggestion and added that I might also be needed on the Western Front, where Anglo-American troops were breaking through the Reich defenses. I inquired about the situation in the East, and he informed me that the Soviets had already broken through the defenses of the Oderbrick, and then I replied that I needed my division in Courland and that I should return to my unit. On February 8, my father accompanied me to the Stuttgart train station, where before boarding the train, a young Red Cross worker treated me to a cup of coffee. The train took me through a devastated country with occasional stops, making the whole trip take about 20 hours. In Berlin I was almost detained by officers from Military District V headquarters and sent to the front on the Upper Rhine, where there was a dire need for reinforcements to stop the American advance. Other officers ordered me to go to the Oder Front. Determined to return to my division, I refused to obey these orders. I wanted to finish this war together with those with whom I had experienced so much, with my old friends and comrades. At Angulter Station I noticed officers and field gendarmes stopping all the men in uniform and carefully checking their documents. Several soldiers were selected into different groups where they stood under guard, while others stood in formation awaiting further orders. Thanks to my awards, I was let through by a military patrol. However, a senior SS officer, accompanied by several gendarmes, soon approached me and politely but firmly ordered me to report to the city commandant's office near Potsdamer Platz. I found the commandant's office in the midst of the ruins of central Berlin, where blackened, crumbling walls dimmed ominously against the night sky. In various places near the headquarters stood crowds of soldiers in rows, while the air was saturated with the roar of air raid sirens, officers could be seen coming and going. In the midst of this commotion, some officer informed me that the Russians were only 70 kilometers from Berlin and had already reached Frankfurt on Oder, and that I would be assigned to command a detachment being sent to the front. I was given my documents back and ordered to report to the air defense center near the Berlin radio tower, from where a bus would take me to my destination. As I left the makeshift headquarters, I noticed the presence of a large military bus on which I was ordered to go to the Air Defense Center. About 50 meters behind the waiting vehicle I noticed an indistinct blue light and could barely make out the word S-Bahn. Quickly and without turning my head, I passed the bus, rushed to the streetcar stop, and disappeared into the stairs leading to the subway. With my heart pounding, I soon boarded a car bound for the Berlin suburb of Zellendorf West, where my cousin Gertrude Brozom lived. Zellendorf had suffered very little damage from the endless bombing. I spent the night discussing events with my cousin. The actor Theo Lingen lived in a neighboring house. The next day, Gertrude accompanied me to the Stetten train station, from where I was to continue my journey back to Kurland. At this station, as I had already seen at Angalter station, Patrols methodically checked the documents of the military. In an effort to avoid contact with the SS dogs and patrols, Gertrude and I walked hand in hand, pretending to be a romantic couple deeply engaged in the emotional conversation typical of a farewell, and avoided eye contact with the people around us. Oddly enough, the ruse worked because we had no problems with the authorities. A few minutes passed, and we saw the general appear, accompanied by a field sergeant, and I instinctively kept close to him, hoping that his presence would keep me safe from the groups of military police who seemed to pay more attention to lone persons in uniform. I approached the general, greeted him, and introduced myself. Then I explained that I was trying to return to my unit in Courland and asked if he would allow me to stay with him for a short time. Of course, son, he exclaimed. I understand how important it must be for you to return to your comrades. Then I said goodbye to Gertrude, and she quickly left the oppressive place. With such a spotless position next to the general, I was no longer detained by police patrols, and when the train moved, 
The general invited me to stay with him in his compartment. He was kind to me and informed me that his name was Muller and that he was on his way to Danzig to take the place of commandant of the city. We were accompanied by a field fibble, his adjutant, who had arrived with him. The next morning I arrived in Staten without any delay. Years later I was told that after the capture of Danzig by the Soviets, General Muller was hanged in that city. When I arrived in Staten, I settled down at the Danziger Hof Hotel, which was run by the Navy. For several days I enjoyed myself in a way I seldom had in the Army, which convinced me of the correctness of the popular opinion that our Navy men take the utmost care of their personnel. The food was plentiful and delicious, and in the evenings we were entertained by some theatrical company, consisting chiefly of attractive young women from Vienna. In spite of the outward luxury in these parts, we were unfortunately well aware of the impending. Russians, who were now standing a short distance from the harbor. The town was packed with refugees who had fled under the onslaught of the Red Army. Everywhere one could see numerous assembled units made up of a mixture of men drafted from anti-aircraft units and labor brigades or discharged from military hospitals. Every morning I went to the Stettin Port Administration, and four days later a convoy was formed for Courland with a call at Danzig. On my last morning on the way to the port, I noticed an elderly man dressed in a now out-of-fashion SA uniform, who had probably been mobilized into the Volkssturm. Bending under the weight of a world war, a rifle hanging behind his back, he carried on his shoulder the only Faust patron with which he intended to fight the Soviet army. Our forces were at an end. Various fishing boats, a destroyer, torpedo boats, minesweepers, and two submarines made up the escort still anchored at Danzig. There we witnessed warships providing fire support to units fighting on the approaches to the harbor. When we left the harbor waters, trawlers were required to trawl the fairway on our course, as there were reports that the British had mined the approaches that night. At noon, we were in the open sea on the traverse of Memel. Many times the convoy was raided by squadrons of Soviet attack aircraft. A bomb hit the steering compartment of our transport, formerly a cargo ship, but now the slowest transport in the convoy. One of the transports took a direct hit in the starboard stern, and within fifteen minutes the ship disappeared beneath the frowning waves. Of the soldiers who boarded the ship, only half were fished out of the water and rescued. During my absence between January 24 and February 3, the second battle for Courland took place. My division did not take an active part in this battle as the Soviet strike was in the Prickholm and Schrunden areas. The soldiers of the 132nd Infantry Division continued to languish in their positions south of Lvava. During my last trip home for the war, our sector of the front remained relatively quiet. With the onset of February the weather became milder and smelled of spring, the blue skies, and sunshine were accompanied only by a light frost in the morning hours. The soggy ground in our positions and streets began to dry out, and the roads became passable again for a short period. The idyllic weather, however, was soon ended by warm winds from the south and west, which brought with them gloomy cloudy skies and endless thunderstorms. Soldiers from farm families predicted steady frosts. As the centennial calendar claimed for February and March 1945. But even experts are wrong. And this year nature showed no desire to follow the calendar's predictions. The battle-hardened soldiers of Courland, especially those who had survived winters farther east, where the climate was much harsher than the Baltic, remained in good health. Few illnesses were reported, and those who were lightly wounded returned to their units as soon as possible to their old underground dwellings. The few old-timers left at the front pinned silver or gold wound badges to their uniforms under the insignia of having participated in hand-to-hand -hand combat, indicating five or more wounds received during our odyssey. The position south of Lvava, where my old 438th Regiment was stationed, were well equipped. The remnants of I Battalion, 438th Regiment, now reduced to the size of little more than a battle group, were stationed almost at the Baltic itself. Located in a swampy, low-lying area, the soldiers had built a low palisade, 
the inside of which was filled with sand, so as to create an area just above the surrounding terrain. Warm dugouts were built near the front line, and those who did not have iron stoves made chimneys and fireplaces of stone and clay. There was a sea of firewood left on the site, and the troops preferred to burn birch logs because they created less smoke giving away our location. The soldiers tried to produce as little smoke as possible by which the enemy could guess our presence, but we saw many columns of smoke daily giving away the presence of enemy fires in the trenches and woods on the enemy side. On my first inspection of the positions I noticed that the dwellings were more than just warm. When one entered a dugout from the cold and damp air, it was as if one had stepped into some sort of oven. Nevertheless, such dwellings were considered acceptable by the troops, and soldiers would make a loud noise when the front door to a dugout or a hanging cloak tent was suddenly left open. In the noisy cries of protest, it was usually heard that the soldiers would rather stink than freeze, and I respected their wishes. Our experience in building defenses on the Eastern Front was put to good use here. It was always interesting to see how, throughout a war in which all belligerents used the most modern weapons and equipment, primitive systems dating back hundreds and thousands of years were used in dugouts and positions through swamps and forests. The bunkers and palisades built by the troops were similar in appearance to those used on the frontier during the American Indian Wars. Bombs, mines, and medium-caliber artillery shells striking the flanks or corners of the positions were capable of inflicting some damage, but the core of the fortifications remained intact. Shell fragments and bullets usually could not penetrate the thick timbers. Instead of the now missing barbed wire, in order to prevent the advance of the enemy's assault troops, the troops installed sharp stakes and logs in the swampy forests in front of the trenches. On February 20, the Russians again attacked our positions with reinforced companies. We came under moderate fire from artillery, katyushas, and mortars. Shells were bursting inside our positions and in the open ground in front of us. Over the morning, the shelling intensified until the bursts reached a steady crescendo. Believing that the barrage of fire that fell upon us would be enough to disable the most advanced lines of defense, the Soviet division's riflemen went on the attack against our positions, rushing at us en masse as the shaft of fire swept over us. In the forest sector they reached us at a distance of 20 meters until they ran into the fire of our defenses. The attackers were met with a deadly crossfire of machine guns and rifles, hand grenades and phosphatrons. Our artillery opened fire on the Russian positions in the rear of the attackers, and while under fire I directed the firing of our mortar platoon at the sites of the fiercest fighting. The few who had held the forward lines had risen, and kneeling behind a ruined barricade, began firing at the fleeing brown figures, whom now rushed to escape into the swamps and woods. The bursting of mines followed their escape route, and as silence fell on the front line, I went around them, eager to assess the situation. With a handful of infantrymen I walked forward between the trenches, examining the dead scattered around. As dusk thickened, we returned to our positions, carrying the papers and numerous weapons of the dead enemy soldiers. Among the enemy dead were several officers wearing new leather belts and pistol holsters. We retrieved the documents from new, similar to our clipboards. The uniforms consisted of quilted jackets and pants of excellent quality, and the freshly painted steel helmets had a matte finish. We collected many pistols and assault rifles that were stamped with the 1944 issue. On the bodies of the enemy soldiers were bundles of grenades and Molotov cocktails, with which they hoped to destroy our fortifications once the perimeter was breached. In front of our positions lay a number of wounded Russians who pretended to be killed or who, having previously lost consciousness, were now trying to get back to their trenches in the thickening darkness. Our patrols and scouts carried them to our trenches, and these soldiers proved to be stout, healthy-looking, and well-fed. As 1945 began, the situation continued to deteriorate from week to week. The army in Courland continued to starve in the grip of an enemy whose reserves in manpower and equipment were immeasurably higher and were constantly being reinforced. The troops both in the forward positions and in the rear were well aware of the hopelessness of the situation. They knew all too well this enemy who threatened defeat 
and everyone realized that behind our backs and on our flanks only through the Baltic lay the saving route to Germany. The rare news from Germany became even more sketchy. Since the first days of March we had received no mail, we had to rely on Wehrmacht reports as our only source of information, and by chance we could hear news of the situation in Germany, carefully couched in optimistic tones, through the soldiers' program from Lubava. Sometimes short news published at the front was shared. Finally, since we no longer fully trusted our sources of information, in small groups of friends we shared news secretly overheard on Swedish radio, and it was through such scraps of news that we stayed informed about the continuing air raids by Anglo-American air armadas, as well as about the new Soviet offensive between the Oder and the Vistula. Finding ourselves with arms in hand in the Curlin trap, there was nothing we could do to prevent the catastrophic fate our country was about to suffer. Despite the bleak news, which was getting worse day by day, Army Kurland continued to defend its position as ordered, to tie up the enemy forces in the Baltic, to facilitate the task of defending the borders of the Reich. A special award was instituted for the troops holding out in Kurland in the form of an armband with the inscription Kurland attached to the sleeve. This armband was made in a small mill in Goldenden and Latvian women were hired to finish this last German military award by hand, sitting in small groups in their homes. The strip was 38 millimeters wide and had an embroidered coat of arms, the Teutonic Knight's Order, and the Balkan Cross on a silver-gray background, and a moose head borrowed from the coat of arms of the city of Matava. Between these two coats of arms were the stern black letters forming the word T-U-R-L-A-N-D. There was little activity in March and April. It was not until the Fifth Battle of Kurland that heavy fighting began again. We replaced the badly thinning 126th Infantry Division in the area west and northwest of Prickholm, and this area on the Warteja River became our last fighting position until the day of surrender. In the left sector in front of Bumka, the Red Army again concentrated large forces for an offensive on the German front and a breakthrough to Lubava. The attack ended in a major rout, and the Soviets retreated under heavy fire from the 70th Rocket Mortar Regiment and the 276th Anti-Aircraft Division. The 14th Armored Division, together with the 21st Airfield Division, reinforced this sector of the front, and the Soviets withdrew only after suffering heavy losses, leaving large numbers of dead and wounded on the battlefield in front of the German positions. The Red Army never fully recovered from the defeat in this sector, and after February 28 the enemy no longer tried to break through in this limited area, attacking in large forces. The middle of March brought a thaw, turning the streets and roads into almost impassable swamps, which could be overcome only at the cost of great effort. The gray-black mud seemed to devour trenches and machine-gun nests, and even the activity of Soviet troops almost ceased as impassable roads thwarted all plans for further attacks. On March 18 our positions were subjected to a short but powerful artillery bombardment, as if thus announcing the beginning of the last great battle for Courland. Parts of our division were sent into action to repel the Soviet attack in the area of Frauenberg and Schrunden before the enemy advance stalled and enemy tanks and other equipment bogged down in the swampy terrain. The unfavorable conditions for the soldiers holding the front became indescribable, and it is impossible to put into words the sacrifice and suffering of the troops in these final days. After another breakthrough by the Soviet 8th Guards Division, the Russians were repulsed by a division on our left flank south of Schrunden, and the enemy suffered heavy losses. 500 men were taken prisoner, 249 machine guns, 185 field guns, 29 mortars, and 27 airplanes were captured, emphasizing the soldiers' determination to stand to the end. In mid-April, the 18th Army anticipated a new large-scale offensive. The I Battalion of the 438th Regiment was replaced at the front and sent to the reserve to rest before the battle. But the battle did not begin. The enemy had begun to exert all his efforts and use all his reserves in the battle for Central Europe, 
and was no longer willing to make heavy sacrifices in the battle against the staunch German defenses between Riga and Lubava. So we too were forced to wait. The front remained relatively quiet, but not asleep. Russian reconnaissance groups were constantly infiltrating through our front line, showing great skill in slipping past our sparse guard, which still averaged two men per 100 meters of defense. These scouting groups invariably made their way to our rear, encountering numerous partisan formations whose activity was increasing every week. There was no rest on the Kurland front, and simply lying down and sleeping became a foreign luxury to us as we fought to survive. The Grenadiers in the forward positions hardly noticed that spring had already arrived. On the evening of May 1, 1945, we learned that Hitler, the greatest military leader of all time, had died. In general, the news of Hitler's death was met with indifference among the troops. However, it must be said, some took it with a sigh of relief. Soon afterward, one night, firing broke out in the Russian trenches, and after a short pause, the hoarse voice of a Russian propagandist was heard booming from a loudspeaker, Berlin is ours. Early the next morning in the dim light of the rising sun, I saw at the edge of the woods 400 meters away large letters of wood or cardboard attached to poles that read, Russians in Berlin. Before dusk a large caliber machine gun crew opened fire on this offensive message and blew it to pieces. On May 5, the battalion was ordered to send scouts to seize a tongue to find out which Russian formation was positioned in front of us. I selected a few reliable soldiers, and as night fell we left our position. Before dawn we returned with two frightened Russians who were transported to the division for interrogation. On this mission, my interpreter Kurt received the dubious honor of being the last company man wounded in the war. His shoulder was tangentially grazed by a bullet fired from a Soviet machine gun, and the superficial wound required only a tetanus shot and a bandage. He insisted on staying on the front lines despite my efforts to send him to the rear. May 8, 1945, was blindingly sunny. All the previous days and weeks there had been persistent rumors in the desperate hope that we would be spared. It was said that the Kurland army would eventually be evacuated. The Western Allies were supposed to be standing, resting, on the Elbe while the remnants of the German Wehrmacht were being reformed and concentrated in order to push the Russians back behind the old Reich borders and throw them out of the heart of Europe. The Americans, the British, and the French have finally realized that the Bolshevik push westward poses a threat to all of Europe. We must not be betrayed and, above all, handed over to the Red Army. Other reports said that the fleets of England and America had been sent to evacuate the troops from Courland, and even that we would join the Americans, who were now engaged in open warfare with the Russians on the Elbe. Soon we learned through reliable channels of another decision, and from this terrible news extinguished all hope of evacuation in the near future. British Field Marshal Montgomery had accepted Admiral von Friedberg's terms of surrender in the North German zone but these terms applied only to the Western Front. The only hope that remained was that the Supreme Allied Commander General Eisenhower would also accept these terms and that they would apply to the Army in the Eastern sectors as well. This would help to spare the long columns of refugees the horror of the Red Army descending upon them and save the troops still resisting the Soviets from the unbearable fate of being tortured for years in gulags and prisoner of war camps. We belatedly learned that on May 1 the commander of the Kurland army issued a communique on the state of affairs, which verbally went around all positions down to the front lines. The CO continuation of is in THEWODST AKAs illoist all meaning and AI is the authority or a man ATE. The war in the East must continue with the key, the same tenacity that we have always shown. The Army Command and TAE Fatherland, although BLEE Dania from numerous Wundies, said and CERDLYHOP that the soldiers of COURLAND will, if you will file their duty, why, to the end, officers and soldiers are obliged 
to be LIV. Then a GRUV of Armaiz will be sent to fight it at ELBA. And DEP plan of evacuating the army of KURLA and DIA, or EMANs in Iforsi. Our 132nd Infantry Division held an area west of Prickhuln in the southern part of the Kurland Front, which is about 30 kilometers from Lvava. While we continued to repulse the Russian troops who were reconnoitering our forward lines, the 11th and 24th Infantry Divisions were marching behind us toward Lvava. For the last few days, the Navy ships of all classes in Lvava and Vindava took on board as many passengers as possible. Fleet commanders received by radio the following message from the Wormicht High Command. To H-E-L-A, L-I-B-A-V-A, V-I-N-T-A-V-A, and M-U-O-R-N-H, on May 5 at 8.00, a CE's fire against Field Marshal Montgomery's formations killed enemies into E-F-F-E-C-T. All transports is at sea will kill and ten new operations to rescue German peers on an eel in DA East. Do Nenote in Jage. Destroy or sink any ships. Safety firest. Fleet radio operators on ships and vessels receive this radiogram from Kriegsmarine headquarters on May 6. To all ships is in DA Bail to sea. In Vailow of Immanian to surrender. All naval and security forces, as goel as dry cargo ships, must leave the portes of C O U R O A N D and H E E L. You know later, then 0.00 on May 9, 1945. Top priority we must be G I V N 2 T U R N S B O R T S from T A T East, K R I Y N German citizens. German sailors tried to salvage what little was left. The 5th Flotilla of patrol ships fought a last sea battle with Russian torpedo boats and prevailed, sinking one of them in the battle. But the lot that decided our fate was cast. General Eisenhower recognized a ceasefire on the Western Front only if the remnants of German troops still fighting the Soviets in the East would also lay down their arms. The Allies possessed immeasurable superiority in aircraft tanks and artillery, and were therefore quite capable of completely annihilating the remnants of German forces. It was reported that, in order to put an end to the resistance of German units stubbornly holding out in Courland, the Russians had already transferred tank regiments from Berlin to use against us. On May 7, the commander of Army Group Kurland appealed by telegraph to the Russian command with an offer of surrender. The Soviets agreed to this only on the condition that the surrender would be carried out personally by Hilpert. They wanted to give their victory at the last hour the greatest possible political value. Thus, the general, who was respected by the soldiers of Courland, passed the most difficult part of his life, condemning his soldiers to surrender to an indescribable fate with his last orders. He was destined never to see Germany again. For in 1946, he died behind the barbed wire of a Soviet prisoner of war camp. On the night of May 7 to 8, our division received the following order. To all troops, Marshal Juvovorovichas Aidgirar ED2 CEAC Hoostalates Big in inning 814.00 on May 8, 1945. All humanities, to take a m e v a t n o t i c o f t h s s order, white f l a g s are to be displayed. A t l l positions. The high command of all troops, I c x p e c t s, complete obedience in t e execution of d a s s order. The f a t e of all troops in c o u r l a n d. DEPENDs are in strict compliance with the TSS order. Two days before the surrender, each battalion was allowed to select twelve soldiers, fathers of large families, to be sent to Germany. The selected soldiers, in full marching clothes, reported to battalion headquarters to receive their final assignment. There was no murmuring among those who were to remain. 
until the last minute, discipline and a sense of camaraderie reigned among the rank and file. To take on board these men, 35 U-52s flew from Norway to Courland. The soldiers loaded into the airplanes. When the airplanes with roaring engines broke away from the strip of Graben airfield, the soldiers who remained on the ground watched the departure with tears in their eyes. No one could imagine what fate would befall this last airbridge from Courland. Shortly after departure, Russian fighters swooped in and shot down 22 quiet, defenseless airplanes. These were the last planes of the German Luftwaffe, which, with all evacues on board, collapsed engulfed in flames, finding their grave on foreign soil and in the cold waters of the Baltic Sea. Other disheartening events took place on May 8 on the docks of the ports of Lubava and Vindava. Soldiers of the 11th Infantry and 14th Armored Divisions, these two fire brigades of the Corlin Army, boarded the hastily assembled ships of the 9th Naval Patrol Flotilla. To create as much room for the men as possible, the sailors who manned the minesweepers, fishing boats, ferries, and harbor boats threw away all unnecessary equipment and cargo. The soldiers, patiently awaiting departure, once again demonstrated iron discipline. There was no discontent, no panic, no crowding under the deadly fire of Russian fighter planes and under the explosions of bombs. When the loading of human material aboard the ships reached a dangerous level, naval officers stopped the columns of soldiers, directing them to ships of shallow draft. Some young soldiers, seeing that there was no more room, voluntarily gave up their places aboard and left the ships to allow older family soldiers to be rescued. After giving up their moorings, the ships slowly pulled away into the open Baltic. Lieutenant General Boge, commander of the 18th Army, addressed those leaving Lubava. Say hello to your homeland from all the soldiers of Courland. Dipping their bows into the foamy high waves of the Baltic, the ships were heading for the western ports. Suddenly, Soviet attack aircraft appeared in the sky and, like birds of prey, swooped down on the slow ships. In the first raids, some evacuees died under machine gun and cannon fire from the planes, but in strict compliance with the order, not a single shot was fired in defense. However, as the planes lay on the wing and went in for a second run, they were met by a deadly wall of barrage fire and then the planes turned away and disappeared over the horizon. Three ships with soldiers of the 44th East Prussian Grenadier Regiment on board could not go along with the convoy and entered Trelleborg. Despite the outward neutrality displayed by the Swedes throughout the war, these soldiers were subsequently given to the Soviet Union. Several ships that sailed from Vindava were intercepted on the high seas by Soviet torpedo boats. The lead ship Rugard turned around and met the attacking gunboats, thus giving the two escorting minesweepers a chance to break away and attempt to escape. The 1,300 men aboard the ship held their breath, expecting the worst. Rugard sailors assembled the dismantled breech block of an 88mm deck gun. As the enemy gunboats continued to approach, their intentions to stop the vessel became apparent. The gun fired the first shot and immediately the order came over the radio telephone of the fleet headquarters to hold the same course forward. With this shot, the Soviet lead boat received a direct hit and, accompanied by the others, turned and moved away, allowing the Rugger to continue on its way. Thus ended the last naval battle in Europe, and more than 25,000 men from the Courland Army made their way across the Baltic to the German ports at Holstein. At the beginning of May, the soldiers in the front lines did not know everything about the events that were taking place far to the rear of the 132nd Infantry Division. They had not heard the words of the last Wehrmacht bulletin sent on May 9, 1945, which was destined to be the last official order from Germany. Our RMI UV in QURLAND, we chief she FO or MLNTHS. His UCCE is SFULOI. Why they stood TATTCKs of tankies and infantry of a superior enemy. In Sussex major battles, demonstrated in few open PA or a bill courage and endurance. 
At an early morning hour, I stepped out of the 4th Machine Gun Company's dugout in the Vartada stream and squinted into the pleasantly cold air of a new spring day. In the rare glades where the ground had been untouched for months by the war raging around us, nature began to show new shoots, bright green shoots began to break through the black soil. Even on the young trees and bushes, broken by shrapnel and shell fragments, tiny buds appeared, as if wanting to show that, despite the madness to which mankind had driven itself, life went on. I was torn from these alien thoughts by the blows of several mines, which exploded in the vicinity one after another at short intervals. The company on the front line still had six large caliber machine guns, four 80mm mortars and two heavy 120mm mortars, and no one had been wounded since Kurt had been shot in the shoulder two days ago. At the mortar position I had set up in a ravine 200 meters behind headquarters, we heard occasional rifle shots from the enemy. Using two large caliber machine guns deep in the line of trenches, I opened fire on the opposite strip of trees where the most enemy activity was observed. The Russians responded with artillery fire. Our artillerymen began to shoot back. At about nine o'clock a group of attack aircraft flew over the battalion positions and dropped bombs. Behind the mortar position several fragmentation bombs exploded, causing no damage. Forward observers reported heavy enemy movements deep in the rear of the rifle brigade facing us. The liaison officers reported to me that ground communication with the battalion was temporarily interrupted because of the shelling, and we prepared our weapons and waited for the attack. At exactly 12.00 noon, the radio received a report from the regiment, which came like thunder. At 1400 echo yours, the surrender of the ACOURA and the army will begin. White FLAGs must be flown along the entire front line. All PERSONEL must remain in position with their weapons. Weapons must be unloaded, magazines removed, and burials cleaned. Officers continue to command their units. At 1300 hours, I heard for the last time on the field telephone the voice of Captain von Daimling, the regimental adjutant. He openly advised me not to take any unwise action, to cease firing immediately, and to show responsibility in guaranteeing compliance with the surrender order, which he repeated orally. He emphasized that strict compliance would determine the fate of an entire section of the front. News of the order for unconditional surrender swept among the soldiers. For years we had fought selflessly, burying our dead and refusing to surrender to a brutal enemy to whom we were still openly and wholeheartedly resisting. I went around our positions several times, talking to the soldiers about the unknown fate that lay ahead of us and trying to calm their nerves. We were no longer frightened by the prospect of death, for we had lived near it and dealt with it for so many years and to such an extent that death on the battlefield in the East was a possibility to be expected, that our inevitable fate was to find a place of repose in an unmarked grave in Russia. We were possessed by the fear of the unknown, of not knowing what would become of us, and even more importantly, of our families in Germany. We had long known what had happened at Katyn in Poland, where the Russians liquidated thousands of Polish officers, and we had no reason not to expect that in the hands of the enemy we would suffer the same fate. The philosophy of fighting to the death had become so ingrained in us during the intervening years that the surrender which the order now prescribed to us was simply unthinkable. The silence that had descended on the front was interrupted by the report of a pistol shot not far from us. Investigating the incident, I found out that one of our officers, upon learning of the surrender order, pulled his Luger from its holster, placed it on his clipboard, and wrote in his notebook, Without an army there is no honor. Then calmly put the muzzle of the gun to his temple and pulled the trigger. The company commander came running to me, waving his pistol frantically and shouting, I will not surrender. I ordered him to put his pistol in his holster and return to his company, to which he responded with threats. Then I took out my pistol, and he disappeared into the thickets of the Wartaya stream, continuing to shout, Down with surrender! I refuse to surrender! 
Then I learned that he rushed to the rear, where he ran into the commander of the self-propelled gun, and still with his pistol in his hand tried to force the officer to advance with the gun to the front line, still shouting. They're surrendering on the front line. Eventually one of the soldiers knocked him down with a blow of his buttstock, and the officer fell unconscious to the ground. He eventually went into captivity. However, while in a prisoner of war camp, he was perceived by the Russians as a somewhat deranged man. The enemy made a final attack on our neighboring regiment, the 436th Infantry, on the last morning of the war in Europe. During the attack, Uncle Sepp received orders to surrender, and he had to use all the art of persuasion to get the battalion commander to call a ceasefire. On the same day, Colonel Drexel received General Rodionov, commander of the division opposing him. The Russians had artillery, and an entire infantry division concentrated opposite Drexel's position, and this was made clear to the colonel. The Soviet general was accompanied by his intelligence officer, who compared his maps with the German staff maps. It is simply amazing to what extent they were informed of our positions. A few weeks before the surrender, the intelligence officer snuck through our lightly guarded positions, disguised in civilian clothes, and studied the entire rear behind our front. Colonel Drexel had only to chuckle as he read the uninvited guest's notes, in which he was often referred to as Uncle Zap. The intelligence officer also knew that Blonde Fred, commander of the I Battalion of the 436th Infantry Regiment, was not averse to tipping a glass on occasion. The Russians expressed surprise that the defense of our line was so sparse. One reason for their surprise was the fact that in the Soviet army for every three men on the front line there was one in reserve. In the German army it was the opposite. The Russian officers were then taken to General Dem to accept the official surrender of the division. The bulk of the division was assembled in the evening of May 8 near the division headquarters, from where the soldiers set off on the multi-day journey to the prisoner of war assembly camp at Tulshe. At 2 p.m. our positions were colored by worn shirts, socks, and bandages tied to the ends of rifle barrels. At this signal of surrender, soldiers in khaki-colored uniforms arose from the edge of the forest opposite us. The Russians crowded our positions, their new uniforms and well-fed bodies a stark contrast to our shabby appearance, bodies emaciated from malnutrition and pale faces from months of living underground in dugouts. The Soviets disregarded weapons and equipment and ran among the soldiers still in their positions, tearing off their awards and insignia, and removing watches and rings from their upraised hands. I was still wearing my camouflage suit over my uniform, and therefore escaped this depredation. I immediately ordered all available personnel to assemble at the company command post and stationed about every ten meters a soldier with an open bolt rifle and no magazine. After this measure, the Russians stopped grabbing the spoils and dispersed in search of prey. A young Russian artillery lieutenant appeared at my company headquarters. He had an immaculate appearance, a clean, well-fitting uniform. His thin face, big blue eyes stared at me blankly as I approached him. By the look of him, he could have been one of many German students from Heidelberg or Tübingen. We greeted each other, and he pulled a map out of a thick leather tablet, claiming he needed to get information on our artillery positions. I could only give him approximate information, and he was surprised that our batteries were located so deep in the rear. He kept asking questions. Why? Why did you keep firing? Hitler was caput a long time ago. Once again, Roving bands of Russian soldiers appeared, and they danced in the middle of the motionless ranks of the Grenadiers, humming, Hitler kaput, Hitler kaput, while they danced and sang. A childish naivety shone on their round faces. The nightmare of war had been erased from their minds. The rows of soldiers could only respond with stony silence, their faces reflecting bitterness and disappointment at what was happening. At last the victors left, and we still received no orders from our regiment, and the latter had to remain in its positions. At about 3 p.m., a cart appeared in front of our dugouts and stopped near the command post. In the cart squatted a Soviet major with oriental features and a face marked with smallpox. He jumped to the ground and approached me on bent legs, a row of medals hanging from his tunic. 
We greeted each other with the traditional military salute, his coal-black eyes furtively scanning the surroundings. From what used to be a package for mortar fuses, he took out a piece of paper from Pravda and a pinch of Mikorka and offered me a cigarette. I politely declined and handed him a German Eckstein, which he accepted with a nod. Then I summoned Lemon, one of our soldiers who spoke fluent Russian, to serve as our interpreter. As he translated what the Major was saying, it became clear that we were to march through the Soviet positions. He added that officers could keep their personal weapons with them to maintain discipline. I explained to him that I could not obey this order, since the last one was to remain in these positions, and no other order had been given. He nodded thoughtfully, climbed onto the cart, and returned to his positions. About thirty minutes later, he reappeared and again through the interpreter ordered me to lead the men across the front line. I repeated that no order had come from our regiment, at which time he drew his pistol from his holster and replied that if I refused he would shoot me and the soldiers would follow him. To this I could only reply, yes, yes, in assent. Then I ordered the soldiers to fall in column and led the battalion forward. We walked a few kilometers along the road through the forest in the direction of Prikon and were surprised to see what a huge number of Russians were confronting us. The forest was full of T-34 tanks, crowded rear guards with Studebakers parked bumper to bumper. Walking along the road, we met a column of T-34s coming towards us, densely covered with tree branches for camouflage and protected from our anti-tank weapons by thick logs tied to the hull. The lead tank driver turned sharply onto a column of prisoners, and we got off the road and passed Soviet tank crews looking up at us from their dark turrets. Soon we came to a small edge in the forest where the Russian colonel had assembled his headquarters. The officers of the headquarters stood in a semicircle, among them several women in neat close-fitting uniforms, their eyes wide with surprise as they peered at us from under their broad fur hats. The unfamiliar and long-forgotten scent of perfume wafted to us. The column stopped, and I stepped forward to formally surrender the I Battalion, 438th Regiment, to the enemy. After several long seconds of silence, I heard a soft voice from the ranks of the Soviet officers. Good discipline. The colonel greeted me with a salute, after which he shook my hand, which I had not expected. He kept asking the same question. Why? Why did you keep fighting? After all, Hitler is long dead. To this I answered simply, because we are soldiers. Then some staff officer in a cap with a blue NKVD cantle came up to me and asked us about the fate of the two Russians we had captured a few days before. I explained that they had been handed over to the regiment in good condition, and he replied in broken German, if that is not so, then, and patted his holster threateningly. Then I was asked if all the weapons had been turned in. I unbuckled my belt with my pistol holstered and handed it to one of the officers, then turned around and asked the soldiers standing silently in formation if anyone had any weapons left. One field officer stepped forward and tried to give the Russian officer his P-38 pistol, to which the officer replied, No, no, shaking his head vigorously. I then took the offered weapon removed the magazine, cleared the chamber, and tossed the pistol to the side of the road. It was explained to me that we would be treated politely and that we would soon be released and sent home. I recklessly grasped at these words with a dim glimmer of hope that maybe this long nightmare was actually ending. Then I was taken not far from the column and invited to sit at a table full of food. I was amazed to see all sorts of dishes and condiments, including canned food where the familiar Oscar Mayer Chicago label was visible on the jars. I politely declined the invitation, explaining that a German officer could not eat until his soldiers were fed. The colonel seemed surprised to hear this reply, and I was unceremoniously led back to the waiting column of prisoners. Then we were given a mounted Cossack to escort us, and he galloped back and forth along the column, unsaddled but at breakneck speed. Just as we moved away from the edge of the forest, a crowd of Russians swarmed upon us again and began to take away the wedding rings, watches, and military decorations of the prisoners. I turned to a Cossack who was rushing at me, 
stopping his horse abruptly in front of me. I took off my watch and offered it to him, explaining that he had been entrusted with the responsibility of maintaining order and that in violation of that order soldiers were being robbed and stripped of their personal belongings. He nodded grimly, and jumping down to the ground, picked a stout club from the edge of the forest and jumped on his horse, and rode straight at the crowd of robbing Russians. Swinging the club like a saber, he frantically struck at the crowd, hitting arms, hands, and backs until the attackers retreated under the protection of the forest. As the sun was already setting, we approached the prisoners' assembly point near the old cemetery, and as night fell, the Russians began to celebrate their final victory, frantically firing machine guns, rifles and pistols into the sky above our heads. They danced in the light of the bonfires, and we were forced to lie on the ground to avoid the tracer bullets that bounced and ricocheted among the graves. The Soviets gathered around us, celebrating their victory, marking it with a ghastly dance and humming an endless chorus of Hitler kaput, war kaput, while galloping and leaping in ecstasy and never ceasing to fire into the air. At dawn the officers were separated from the privates. A sense of the pain of defeat began to set in. Soldiers were shorn, herded into large columns to be driven like cattle to the east. Small groups of German soldiers, who had been captured earlier and represented an anti-fascist organization, appeared in front of us and began to talk about the benefits of communism. The very presence and words of these collaborators were met with cold silence by the Corland veterans. After a few hours' respite, we were on our way again. After three days of constant walking, we received our first rations, liquid soup in which pieces of cabbage leaves floated. This was only a hint of what the future held for us. The illusions of good treatment we had been assured of soon evaporated, for the rear units did not recognize the justice observed by the soldiers on the front lines. Endless crossings on primitive roads through swamps and forests began. The column moved with difficulty eastward between the heavily armed guards who accompanied us along the roadside, through the funeral rites of total defeat to the final final of the war and to the unknown.